And that one person that clicks that link, that grants the rights into your organization, bypasses all of the perimeter security controls that you had in place and gains an attacker access to that workstation. That scares me. That keeps me up at night. That was Paul Truitt, Principal and National Cyber Practice Lead at Mazars, on why U.S. digital infrastructure is leaving itself exposed to potential malicious activity. Welcome to Capital Considerations, the market and economic podcast that's fully invested in your success. I'm your host, Tony Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Wilmington Trust. With Russia's military forces facing unexpectedly fierce resistance and condemnation on the global stage, there's talk of non-traditional escalation. This could be nuclear, bio, chemical, horrid things that we don't even like to talk about, frankly. But there's also one other category, which are cyber attacks. In the early days of the conflict, we saw Ukrainian banks, other governmental agencies, websites temporarily shuttered by Russian groups that were engaging in different kinds of cyber warfare. And with the U.S. playing a leading role in the global effort against Putin's regime and and their activities, the risk to our own infrastructure and digital security from a Russian cyber attack or series of attacks is also at play. So to help us to mention the potential outcomes from a cyber attack and the risks inherent in this space, we're joined today by Paul Truitt. Paul is a principal and the national cyber practice lead at Mazars, where he specializes in identifying and mitigating security risks for clients in multiple areas of the economy, which include retail, healthcare, manufacturing, and banking. He holds numerous licenses and certifications in the space, including those of Certified Hacking Forensics Investigator, which sounds a little bit scary in and of itself, Certified Information Security Manager and Certified Information Systems Security Professional. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Tony. It's a pleasure being here. So, Paul, let's start with Mazars. Tell us who is Mazars. Sure. So Mazars is a global accounting firm uh, that has a large consulting practice. I'm part of the consulting practice within Mazars. Um, And, you know, we've been around, actually, we just celebrated our 100th year anniversary. So, Paul, one of the things that's probably most remarkable about this idea of cyber attacks as it relates to the conflict that's going on in Ukraine and, and Russia is that we haven't seen all that much activity that's been particularly damaging. Um, I mentioned at the outset that there was a set of attacks that were sort of fought off at the very beginning of the war. There was the via sat attack, which brought down one of the main communication networks that was satellite based in Ukraine. But since then, there really hasn't been uh, an awful lot um, going on from a cyber standpoint. So with all the concern around cyber attacks, maybe the first place to start is where are they? What's happening? And why aren't we seeing more? Sure. Um, You know, from my perspective, I think cyber has been an aspect of the overall war between Russia and Ukraine. There has been, you mentioned a few of those circumstances um, on what they've done, but it's much more been a, a ground warfare, right? I think, you know, they've been more focused on some of the, you know, military efforts rather than cyber efforts. I think a lot of that is um, really just based on the type of war that, that they're having, not necessarily lack of capability or lack of uh, of interest in cyber as an aspect. Cyber is much more of a potential threat to Europe and the United States from an attack perspective, mainly because it's significantly more difficult for Russia to have any kind of ground warfare within larger or more established countries. And so I expect that we we do have much greater level of, of cyber risk here against the United States. In other words, they just haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah. I mean, right now, the ground warfare, they haven't really got onto it yet, but they're, it's not because they can't do it. No, I, I don't think that that's at all the case. And very recently, there's been additional chatter of, of potential attack against the U.S. Or, or against other countries that are cooperating to assist the Ukraine. One of the more intuitive lines of thinking that I always pursue is the idea that, well, we had Colonial Pipeline, we had the solar winds, and if you will, the way I conceptualize it is that there were certain doors that were open that they walked through in order to perpetrate those attacks. I would have to imagine that all the folks that are in the space 
like yourselves can see those doors and then advise their clients, okay, you got to close these doors. And you start with a baseline where there may be a hundred doors open. And then you, you keep on closing those doors, keep on getting better at protecting from these kinds of attacks. For example, in order to get into your website as a client at Wilmington Trust, you have to do double authentication, which is not something that we had even a few years ago. So I would imagine it's quite a bit harder now. So isn't it getting harder for these perpetrators to try to inflict this pain and harm on our digital economies or digital realities? Or is that not the case? Yeah, so harder, sure. Um, I would say that it is much harder today than it probably was, you know, three, five, ten years ago. It's different vectors of attack that we're seeing. It's different types of attack. We're not necessarily seeing a lot of open doors, as you described them. Um, a lot of the open doors have been closed. The problem is, is we have a lot of filtered doors. And so what is a filtered door? We have a lot of access that still needs to exist, right? So for a bank like Wilmington Trust to function, you do need to have a public internet-facing website. You need to have online banking for your customers to be able to perform transactions. You need mobile apps that can gain access into your environment. Um, you need just for business functionality, you need email communications. And then let's talk about some of the other points of, of potential risk. You have communications with third parties, uh, direct interactions between, uh, you know, a banking organization and any kind of, uh, whether it's for IT services type activities, monitoring services, or if it's banking transaction related activities of, of third party communications and, and access. All of those channels that I just described are, are required to be open with other organizations or open to the world. You can put security controls on them, but they the nature of being open in communication with the world leaves them potentially exposed if there's a risk that someone might find or a threat that someone might find. And sure, are we constantly looking at those potential doors or those filter doors and making sure that our filters are actually working and picking things up? At a larger organization, I'd say yes. At a lot of smaller organizations, we struggle. And so those smaller organizations that don't have dedicated security teams, that may not even have dedicated IT teams, and they're using third-party services and support, or maybe not doing that at all, those are easier channels in. And a lot of these larger organizations have relationships with those companies that potentially could lead the insecure organization to gain a hole into the secured or more secured organization. It's interesting when I hear you articulate this, that it makes me recall, Paul, the many times that I've been working to put in place enhanced services for our clients, whether it be using a third party, for example, to run enhanced performance analytics. And when we negotiate those arrangements, we don't only negotiate the cost and the service level in terms of how frequently we want those statistics provide, but now we spend a lot of time thinking about what type of protocols are being deployed and what it, with what type of oversight and refreshing and industry standards, et cetera, around the cybersecurity of that third party, because we're starting <laughs> to recognize that if they're not safe, then we're not safe because that's, of that's our right. connections. And I, think, and I think that's what you're referring to, right? That's it. It could be the connection in uh, that they're required to have to interact with your systems. It could be that they have your data um, and they're doing something processing data oriented. And so in those scenarios, you really don't have control over their security architecture and design. You don't have control over them letting you know in a timely manner that they had a data breach. You can have contractual obligations that wrap around that. And most larger organizations have a pretty good third party management program, but you're still trusting that third party in some way, shape or form. And unless you're doing a really good job with a third party management audit program, which I can tell you most banking institutions do a pretty good job with that, but there is still risk associated. I think it was yesterday, the day before, the announcement of Okta, which I don't know if you're familiar with Okta, but that's a trusted third party that many organizations use for authentication. So you enter your username and password and, and likely multi-factor, so a, a token or something along those lines, into your Okta framework. And then Okta as a third party has access behind that into a lot of your applications. It's a it's a front end uh, password safe for, for you know simpler terms, um, but it's a little more advanced than that. And Okta had a data breach, right? It was through one of their third parties. 
someone breached the organization through the third party. And I think I saw that the numbers are varying, um, but I think I saw uh, some significant portion of their customer base that was impacted by this data breach and potentially exposed. And so this is a third party that's a security firm that you trust and you use to implement security protocols inside of an organization. And, you know, was was Russia behind that? I don't think I've read anything as to understand exactly where the source was in that. Apparently, the breach happened back in January, and they just came clean with it, which is another scary aspect that we talked about a second ago of how quickly are your third parties letting you know that they had a data breach? Um, and, you know, I'm not an Okta customer, so I don't know if maybe they let customers know sooner than that and the public just didn't find out until two days ago. But gosh, January to, to the end of March is a long period of time to have a potential massive exposure on the front end of a lot of organizations. So it sounds like while we're closing doors and if the environment in which we operated was static, we could probably get to a point of very high security fairly quickly. But the reality is we live in an environment where the digital space is entirely dynamic, not static. And it's constantly changing and constantly importing new innovation in order to improve and be competitive. And it's through that process that we open new doors as we close the old doors. Absolutely. I mean, even look at Internet of Things, uh, IoT related risks, right? I mean, the Alexa device that sits inside your home is a new innovation but it's a new vector of attack into your, and, and that's on a home residence, but <laughs> there's probably a lot of uh, Alexa sitting on company networks that we don't realize, or camera footage that's connected to a security control system that's now on, the, on your network and potentially a vector of attack within your organization. So sure, sure. I mean, right. we are constantly I mean, changing, constantly adapting. Yeah, I mean, my wife has famously within the little ecosystem of my tiny family of four people for years and years and years, she said, I don't want any series or Alexas on any devices in my house listening to what I'm doing. And of course, she's talking and then all of a sudden, unwittingly, Siri or Alexa responds to her because someone's phone, phone was on listening to this conversation. Right. And of course, she gets very, very paranoid um, due to that. So it's, it, there's always a, a, an unperceived, if you will, a boogeyman or big brother or some type of entity watching over your shoulder, even in your own house now, you have to be careful. Absolutely. And the number of devices inside of your home. I mean, you know, let, let's put the business aside for a second and look at the threat vector inside of an, a, a home residence. And by the way, you can multiply that tenfold or more inside of an organization. But in your home, you know, five years ago, you probably had an Xbox uh, an earlier days Xbox, you might have had your um, some kind of smart television that was, you know, one or two of those in your home. Um, so there's maybe five, eight devices today. I'll bet there's 50 devices in every one of my neighbor's homes, non-technology people that just have they have a ring doorbell. They've got a smart right. TV They're in their room. Yeah. I mean, they're they're very, very connected cameras throughout homes. And those are vectors of attack or potential attack inside of a home that potentially puts you at risk or in harm's way. Let's focus on the United States only because they're probably in the center of the crosshairs um, from a Russian standpoint, um, given the perceived role they see us playing in this uh, geopolitical scenario. What are the kinds of attacks that are keeping you up at night? Is it is it shutting down the cooling system on a nuclear plant? Is, is it somehow preventing the defense department or the defense systems from operating effectively? Is it something else? Yeah, so I'll be honest with you, all of those things scare the scare me. Um, but there's a ton of vectors of attack that, that a lot of our clients see on a day-to-day -day basis. The most common that we're seeing right now that I expect will continue to grow in, in impact because of how easy it is to perform is ransomware attacks. Or let's step back from that. It starts typically with a phishing attack. And so, you know, all the controls that you described, all those doors that you close, well, your weakest point is the one person in your organization that falls for something from an inbound email communication, right? Whether it's, you know, the silly things of, you know, click here to see the dancing kitty cat or, you know, um, click here because uh, you're, and what did I just receive one this morning um, that said something about my, my um, order on my credit card. It was qualified for some kind of a coverage or something. And I think the goal was to get me to click the link to actually link into my my credit card account. Uh, and I assume that I would have had my uh, username and password skimmed in the process of that. 
which, you know, those threats or those type of attacks are being performed every day, all day long against people that are within organizations, whether it's your own personal email communication, whether it's your business email that receives them. And that one person that clicks that link that grants the rights into your organization bypasses all of the perimeter security controls that you had in place and gains an attacker access to that workstation. That scares me. That keeps me up at night. And how quickly can I flag that? How quickly can I see that from my client and stop that type of a behavior? Because I can't always stop the initial vector of attack. What I can stop is I can stop the behavior that happens once that occurs. So there's elevation of privilege that happens. There's an attempt to see what else is going on in the environment. Where else can they grow their footprint? We can see those behaviors as long as the organization has monitoring services, has good endpoint detection services. There's a number of technologies that can really help flag those activities. What are the harms? That are, what are their goals, their objectives? I think of it as a set of, of outcomes that they can accomplish that don't result in any monetary or, or other benefit accruing to them directly, but rather create profound disruption to us as their enemy. So classic example, shut down the electrical grid right. or the water supply. You know, we can't function as a society. Anarchy breaks out. You know, we're living in a dystopian scenario, right? Taking it to an extreme here. But that's one side of the continuum. The other side is trying to go in and appropriate funds out of a bank account and maybe ransomware somewhere in between, perhaps. Where do you think we're most exposed or where do you think the biggest threats are right now? Yeah, let's take uh, uh, Russia out of the picture for a second and we'll put them back in in a minute. Um, but take that out of the picture. And I think most of what we're seeing today is attacks against organizations in not necessarily a targeted fashion. These are blanket attacks against individuals and organizations. And honestly, the attackers are tending to take whatever they get on the other side. So gaining access is hopefully going to give them, at minimum, an individual that's going to follow their request and commands, right? I, I was just talking to a family friend. They fish attacked their mother and they took their identity. They got them to go to the store and get them a gift card. They went through all these things. It just got them some level of monetary uh, information. Well, that's probably because when they got to the other side of whatever they were doing, it wasn't a business. It wasn't something that was more interesting. So let's use the advantage of the opportunity of whatever we have and be opportunistic and take some cash. The bigger win is when they get to a business on the other side that's interesting. And so, again, I don't know that a lot of these type of attacks are targeted. They can be. Um, but most of them seem to be much more just opportunistic in nature. And they'll take whatever they can do if they find it's a company. A lot of times they'll take that next step to try and perform ransomware and see if they can get, you know, instead of getting the $4,000 they might have got from an individual from whatever they stole, they're going to try and get $4 million by or maybe a million or whatever they end up trying to put ransomware out there and take your data and potentially use that to their advantage. Paul, this didn't mention this. How many successful cases of ransomware perpetrated by foreign sources do you think happened last year in the United States? <laughs> Right. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I mean, really? the organizations impacted by ransomware, I've got to think more than, I don't know, between last year and this year, I'll bet a quarter or more of organizations have had some level of ransomware attack. I get a call almost every day from one of our clients that's had a ransomware attack. And some of them are minor some of them are more significant than that. It could be an individual's machine. It could be some servers. It could be their entire data center. And, you know, it's a variable, but, and it's happening to organizations that have strong security programs. When you say an attack, are you saying a successful attack? A successful, a successful attack. attack. Where they're actually able to extract value, direct value from their, act their behavior. And we're seeing it more in the small to mid market than we are in enterprise. That kind of goes down the path of, of the reasons and the things we talked about earlier, which is whether it's an attempt to exploit those organizations and use them as a vector into the enterprise, or whether they're just finding it easier and more opportunistic to attack the mid-market because they don't have the same level of security control and third-party monitoring services that these larger organizations have. If I'm a, a customer of one of these large multi-state electrical grids, does that mean that they're likely to be better protected than a smaller outfit or a small local water company 
are the bigger companies the running our economy, are they going to be, you know, you think they're better protected or do you think that we're really from an infrastructure standpoint here, really a quite, quite great exposure? Yeah. So let, let's look at that question in two different ways, because what I, what I shared from an opportunistic perspective in an opportunistic nature, I would say that they're probably less likely a target. And the reason for that, the bigger companies, the reason for that is because they're not probably listening on the easy path. And so, you know, take it the same thing as um, in your community with your doors locked and maybe an alarm system sign in your front yard. You're less of a target because you've made an investment in making sure your doors are locked. And you've got a sign out front that says monitored by ADT. Well, your neighbor down the street still has the default quick set door lock. Not that quick set's a bad company, but it's, you know, it's the door lock that probably came with the home. It's probably a lower class than maybe the one that you invested in to upgrade. And you don't have the sign out front that says you have an alarm system. And so that home down the street is likely going to be broken into before yours is. But does that mean yours is not exposed or at risk? No, it doesn't. It just means it's not as exposed as that person down the street. It's the same thing with a lot of organizations. If you've got good monitoring services and good controls in place, you're probably less likely to see an impact unless you're targeted as a potential point of concern. So that's the today model, but the tomorrow model or a threat that's coming from Russia of trying to impact the United States, that's drastically different. And that changes the game a good bit because that large organization now becomes a bigger, interesting target. So if you think about our country, think about the private sector, the public sector, I would have to believe that the Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan's and Microsoft's and Pfizer's, the premier companies are, are going to rank the highest in terms of their overall ability to, to deflect these threats. Whereas the government, now whether the Department of Defense is different than the rest of the government, um, I don't know, but the government would probably be less, less well run, less efficient perhaps less well-funded. So when you think about the electric grid and the water system, those would probably be more at risk than the world of finance, private finance, et cetera. Potentially, you do have controls that have been defined and analysis that's been run against some of those government organizations. We saw a, uh, a set of controls that were improved by the federal government within federal agencies after some of the breaches recently that happened. Um, there was kind of that spat of, of data breach at the end of last year that created a lot of concern within the federal government. And so we did see some improvements made there. But, but sure, you also have a, from a desired attack perspective, I'd say financial services and something that would impact human life or put chaos, mass chaos in the U.S. for citizens as the most desired targets in a, in a cyber warfare type thing. So if we were looking at where is that potential risk or impact, those are the two vectors of attack. And both of those entities, so maybe electric manufacturing, power manufacturing, or a grid or a banking institution, whether it was wealth management uh, or you know retail banking, whatever it may be, those style organizations have third parties that they're working with. So even if they've put the right controls in place, there's potential avenues of coming into those organizations through a third party. And the other thing to keep in mind is we just talked about ransomware type activities, or we talked about um, phishing attacks, and that's still a vector of potential attack that all it takes is, is getting in the door and leaving yourself quiet once you're in the door and then going at it once you've got a half dozen, dozen, two dozen hosts inside of an organization that you're trying to gain access to. So is it possible that U.S. banks, uh, U.S. national infrastructure organizations already have bots that are accessible that have been exploited that just no one's actually done anything with that are sitting dormant right now? Very possible. And so if Russia has those at their disposal, they've made purchases on the dark web to buy access into some of these organizations, they may already have vectors in that they can launch all at once, which creates tremendous amounts of confusion and generates a, you know, your incident response plan that you may or may not have a good sure. attack uh, response to. So really the only way to be safe and, and you get paid to be circumspect, right? So that's your job, but is to, you know, really live off the grid. You have to have <laughs> solar panels on your house. You have to have well water. You have to have a septic tank and a big fence around your house, and then you're self-sufficient. Um, but absent that, 
you're going to be exposed, right? I mean, that's fair. But though you don't live that way, right? You, oh, you're absolutely. probably honest about that. Absolutely don't live that way. And, and I'll be honest, I don't want to live that way. So, you know, I love the freedoms of this country. And so um, in living my life in a way that I'm not worried about things that I actually know more about than I probably should. And so, you know, but there's a reality that you can't run a business that way. It won't function. Can you run a one segment of the Department of Defense that way? Probably, right? You could be completely disconnected. You could have, you know, no cell phones in the building when you come in. And but it's no way to live. It's not a it's not a happy, a happy place to be. And so I would say that's the only way to be completely safe. But there are ways you can put controls in place to be able to quickly identify. Can you stop someone from getting in the door of your organization? No. I don't care how many walls you have up. If you're connected to the internet and someone is bound and determined to gain access to you, they can gain access. What you can, however, do is have the right controls in place and the right technology and the right people watching those behaviors to flag potential things that are causing risk. And so if you can quickly respond, you can stop that from happening and spreading inside your organization. So what is the risk to us as individuals that are clients of these top institutions, you know, Wilmington Trust and M&T Bank, one of the top 10 or 12 banks in the country now, the JP Morgans and Goldman's, et cetera. Do we have to worry every day we wake up and say, well, gee, is the balance in my account still going to be there? Or will there have been a bot that went into the system and raced everything overnight? How do we calibrate for that in our, in our lives? Yeah, I mean, look, is it possible? Potentially, right? But there's enough checks and balances within systems like that to make sure that one, you know, you've got backups of your systems. Banking institutions are, for the most part, doing a pretty good job, especially the larger banking institutions, are doing a very good job of making sure that they're quickly responding, they're identifying potential malicious behavior, or potential anomalies in their systems. And so I think the risk is relatively low of, of waking up in the morning and having the balance changed or, or disappearing inside of your account. And if it does, for whatever reason, I think there's enough controls in place, at least in my experience, that they're going to be able to recover that in a pretty easy way. Now, is it possible that you might wake up in the morning and not have access to that banking institution. And so that's that's a lot more likely scenario, in my view, is a denial of service attack, some type of an exploit that causes the bank to have to disconnect from the Internet and potentially disconnect from transaction related activities. That's possible. I think it's a temporary problem more than a permanent problem, though. I probably in a biased way, certainly in a proud American way, you know, like to think we built the Internet. Right. So we built the Internet um, It's primarily ensues from American companies. And if anybody knows how to tamper with it and engage in mischief, it should be us. But there's something about the way our society is structured relative to some of these more, let's call them malign actors out there, actor being Russia, North Korea, China, where we live in a certain structure with a certain level of baseline ethicality, and we have a certain level of employment, and so we don't have a lot of, if you will, excess marginal actors in our society and looking for some kind of reward, um, whether it be from the state or whether it be directly through these activities. We don't have a lot of players like that that are somehow ta tacitly sponsored or, or, or somehow promoted by the state. Whereas in a country like Russia or China, there's tens of thousands or millions of people like that probably that are idle, that are smart, that have a computer, that are engaged in that kind of behavior. And so when I think about, well, gee, how come we're not doing the same thing back to them? Well, we probably are, but it's probably only happening for the most part within the context of the NSA or you know one of our actors. It doesn't really have that same level of prevalence just due to the way our society is sort of set up um, and the way it operates. Am I onto anything there, do you think? Or, or how do you react to that picture I've painted? Yeah. So you're right. Um, I would say that, you know, if you look at attack maps, there's there's a number of different organizations that post 
kind of where defense lines are being run. I think Fortinet is a good one that is out there that has their whole network of Fortinet firewalls out there within organizations globally that are showing threat-based behavior, attack-like behavior in a map where it sort of looks like a missile coming in from different places. And the vast majority of those attacks are coming from overseas in similar places, uh, certain countries, certain zones that have l- less restrictions, less laws associated with that type of behavior hitting the United States. We're a common recipient of attack. We're not necessarily the sender. We are in some cases. We do see some within country type stuff and we see and some of that's politically driven. There could be a variety of reasons we see see that behavior within the U.S. But yeah, I mean, are, are we a bigger target because of that? Potentially, I would say that we're also doing more from a spend perspective of having good guys. So while you may have more attackers within foreign countries, you have like, and, and I don't know what the actual stats show, um, but I would expect we are hiring more defenders of security within the U.S.-based organizations um, because of the size, because of the complexity, because of the um, just value of our assets um, to defend against those guys. And so um, you're seeing a lot of that type of um, back and forth. And, you know, maybe we call it the bad guys versus the good guys, right? And it doesn't always mean that the bad guys will win if we have equal number of good guys defending us here in the U.S. So, I mean, it almost sounds like then that the, the height of your defense, of your wall, right, is only going to be as good as your response to the last set of attacks. And so conversely, if the bad guys, those states are not really being attacked as much, they should be vulnerable. And so if we decided, we being the U.S. government, let's just assume, right, let's just assume we know a lot of these sort of truants going out and sua sponte committing these acts, but the government should be able to then say, you know what, we're going to ramp up our efforts and be offensive vis-a-vis Russia, and they should be pretty vulnerable. Is that not the case? I would tend to agree with that. I wouldn't expect that we would have a lot of walls up against us if we attacked other countries that are threatening to us. And so we have not taken the offensive that I know of, um, although there may be government activities going on behind the scenes where we are probing organizations or probing government entities to determine what potential vectors of attack could we use in the event we need to. So I would expect that we have folks, and you mentioned the NSA and whatever other three-letter agencies have hacking folks engaged with them, and there are plenty of those, I would expect that they are out there uh, evaluating where they might take uh, an attack if we used cyber as a vector of war. I mean, the way we tend to think, in this country at least, we tend to think that if we engage in the behavior, then we endorse the behavior. So we're therefore going to refrain. Yeah, I mean, look, I think cyber being an aspect of war is is somewhat new. If we were to take an offensive approach to Russia or North Korea, is is that deemed an act of war? And does that get retaliated with both cyber and um, you know actual you know weaponry warfare? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and so I think we've got to be careful of how we approach that and what we use in order to perform those type of attacks. And, you know, I would say that as of right now, we're, we're more of a defensive front. And that defensive front can change into an offense if threatened or if we feel as though we need to become more offensive. So, you know, I, I truly believe that we have the, that ability and we have plenty of people who are defending in this country that have the capability of attacking. And those of us that are in penetration testing type roles inside of the con- inside of this country that are performing services for you know firms helping figure out what risks exist, those same people could be spun around the other direction and help the U.S. government and whatever other entities in order to perform offensive attacks. So, Paul, what do you recommend that our clients do to protect themselves? Yeah, and let's let's talk about it from a personal first. You talked a little bit earlier about online banking and and the fact that Wilmington Trust and others have multi-factor authentication or two forms of authentication. Make sure that you're using that, right? I mean, that's the number one thing that I would propose is a lot of banking institutions have the capability of allowing you to use 
what's called multi-factor. And, and I'll describe that for a second, because if you're not familiar with it, it's it's really your username, your password, and something else that you have that identifies who you are, whether it's a, a text message, which I'm iffy on whether I think text messaging is the right second factor, um, but some kind of a token of some sort that, that you have that others don't have um, that allows you to protect your accounts. If you don't have that turned on, you are at risk and you're not taking advantage of the security controls offered to you by most financial institutions. If your financial institution doesn't offer multi-factor authentication, I would exit that financial institution. I would move your money or do not set up an online account. And so that's my first piece of it. I would say the second piece of it is be wary anytime anything comes to you that you didn't solicit, whether it's a phone call, whether it's an email, whether it's a a letter that comes in the mail, whatever it is, if you didn't ask for it, you can't guarantee that it came from the person that they say they are because it arrived into your inbox or into your mailbox or into your phone without you asking for it. So the immediate reaction is simple. I'm sorry, I don't give information to inbound phone calls or inbound communications. I'm going to call the number that I know, that I trust, that I believe is the right answer on the back of your credit card, on the on your bank statement, on other communications that you have on the corporate website of the organization. Make that phone call to validate that something is real and it is not just clicking a link. So always assume that it's that it's not real um, or that it's false until you prove otherwise. And then, you know, talking a little bit about a business, because I think a lot of your uh, a lot of your clients are probably business owners. Um, or involved in some kind of a business entity. And so I think it's very, very important for our small to mid-sized companies to make sure that you're doing security testing, you're performing some kind of analysis against your organization for what potential threats exist. How easy is it to exploit your organization? Are there things listening on the public internet that shouldn't be, that can be cleaned up? Do you have segmentation? So is there walls inside of your organization to stop potential threats from moving around in the environment? And have you had a third party evaluate that and test that for you? That's extremely important to be doing as an organization. And have you done any kind of a, an incident response test, right? So, you know, asking the question within your organization of if something happens, did we identify it? Did we see it quickly? And did we did we test to see what we would do when that happens and how we would respond? And is that written down somewhere? And so, you know, these type of threats and these type of activities, the faster you respond, the more consistently you respond and the less you respond, like what's the slogan? Chicken with your heads cut off, right? If you're running around aimlessly as a response strategy, you will not do what you're supposed to do. You should have a defined structure and approach and be able to handle that as an organization. Well, recently. I purchased a charger for a device and I bought it from Best Buy and I sent it and then it, it wasn't the right voltage. So we had to figure out what to do with it. So we called up Best Buy and I was engaging this experience in a very sort of almost dismissive kind of amused way because they're asking me, you know, Tony, what's your shoe size? We want to know, you know, which of these cities are you associated with? Just so I can, return, you know, get a new a nine dollar charger. If I was talking to, um, you know, Fidelity, maybe or someone like that, okay, this would be appropriate. But this is Best Buy. Who cares, right. right? But you know, for all I know, they've already got enough information on me that if I didn't authenticate myself in the right way, there'd be some there'd be some consequence. So you know, even that I should probably take more seriously because you never know how yeah. this sort of web of connections is, it actually can lead to different outcomes. Sure. And and at least in that scenario, it was solicited. It wasn't unsolicited, right? You were at the point of presence. Right. You And so you knew the third party was legitimately Best Buy because you were in the Best Buy store. So in a scenario that someone were to call you from Best Buy and say, hi, this is, this is Paul from Best Buy. Um, we need to yeah. reset your account. That's where you get really wary. I remember walking into a, a some kind of rental place and, and they wanted my social security number. And I said, well, that's interesting. What do you need my social security number for? They said, well, it's on the form. Said, well, that's not a good reason. And so, I mean, like, there's no reason to give them any of that information. We're running out of time, unfortunately. This is fascinating. I'm going to just summarize three takeaways, I think. One is that we're at great risk from cyber attack. And the risk is actually playing out in ways that 
are not even transparent to us. In other words, there are companies where we learned here today that are the subject of just ransomware alone, much less different other forms of cyber attack, like denial or service denial or many other different types. When you add it all up, almost every company out there is being attacked through the internet and a meaningful percentage of them are successful. And the second takeaway is that the risk is perpetual. And that's been hard for me to really appreciate personally. I've always thought within the paradigm that, okay, so the door is open, we learn, we get better, we close the door, we batten down the hatch, we're okay now. And the reality is that as soon as we open a door, we close one door, we seem to be opening two or three new doors in terms of the number of devices that we interact with and the embedded flaws in the new software that we're using, the number of additional service providers we're using and the flaws that they may have, especially if they're less rigorous. And the threat is really interconnected across the ecosystem. And then the third takeaway is that it pays to be paranoid. It pays to be extremely vigilant on a personal level and to ensure that we're not giving information to anybody unless we should be giving information. We're not doing anything that will, in an untoward way, allow people to access our information when we're not not even aware of it. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that when we evaluate companies now from an ESG standpoint, environmental, social, and governance, um, we include cybersecurity. And when we're evaluating enterprises and we look at the quality of their cyber pro- their cybersecurity program um, as best we can in evaluating whether that enterprise is a good enterprise to invest with. So we think about it from an investment perspective in a pretty active way here, here at Wilmington Trust. And we take these issues very, very seriously. So with that, Paul, I want to thank you so much for being here today. It was really a really fascinating conversation. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I want to encourage everyone to visit WilmingtonTrust.com for a full roundup of our investment and planning ideas. And you can subscribe to Capital Considerations on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast channel to ensure you receive future episodes. Thank you all for listening today. This podcast is for information purposes only and is not intended as an offer or solicitation for the sale of any financial product or service or recommendation or determination that any investment strategy is suitable for a specific investor. Investors should seek financial advice regarding the suitability of any investment strategy based on the investor's objectives, financial situation, and particular needs. The information on Wilmington Trust's capital considerations with Tony Roth has been obtained from sources believed to be reliable, but its accuracy and completeness are not guaranteed. The opinions, estimates, and projections constitute the judgment of Wilmington Trust as of the date of this podcast and are subject to change without notice. Wilmington Trust is not authorized to and does not provide legal or tax advice. Our advice and recommendations provided to you is illustrative only and subject to the opinions and advice of your own attorney, tax advisor, or other professional advisor. Diversification does not ensure a profit or guarantee against a loss. There is no assurance that any investment strategy will be successful. Past performance cannot guarantee future results. Investing involves a risk and you may incur a profit or a loss. Any reference to company names mentioned in the podcast should not be constructed as investment advice or investment recommendations of those companies. Facts and views presented in this report have not been reviewed by and may not reflect information known to professionals in other business areas of Wilmington Trust or M&T Bank and may provide to seek to provide financial services to entities referred to in this report. M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust have established information barriers between their various business groups. As a result, M&T Bank and Wilmington Trust do not disclose certain client relationships or compensation received from such entities in their reports. Investment products are not insured by the FDIC or any other governmental agency, are not deposits of or other obligations of or guaranteed by Wilmington Trust, m and Bank, or any other bank or entity, and are subject to risk, including a possible loss of the principal amount invested. Wilmington Trust is a registered service mark used in connection with various fiduciary and non-fiduciary services offered by certain subsidiaries of m and Bank Corporation, including, but not limited to, Manufacturers and Traders Trust Company, m and Bank, Wilmington Trust Company, WTC, operating in Delaware only, Wilmington Trust NA, WTNA, Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, Inc., WTIA, Wilmington Funds Management Corporation, WFMC, and Wilmington Trust Investment Management, LLC, WTIM. Such services include trustee, custodial agency, investment management, and other services. International corporate and institutional services are offered through M&T Bank Corporation's international subsidiaries. Loans, credit cards, retail, and business deposits 
and other business and personal banking services and products are offered by M&T Bank, member FDIC. 2021 M&T Bank Corporation and its subsidiaries, all rights reserved. Private market investments are only available to investors that meet the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission's definitions of qualified purchaser and accredited investor. 